All right, we're headed to the first chapter of Acts once again, continuing a, a short series we're doing on these first 11 verses of Acts chapter 1. So I invite you to turn in your phone or in your own Bible or the church Bible in front of you. And we're actually going to read from verse 4 to verse 11 this morning. Hear the word of the Lord. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? The same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. The grass withers and the flowers fade, but this the word of our God will endure forever and ever. Amen. Well, when we talked about this passage a couple of weeks ago, we noted several important things. And in case you weren't here or able to see the message online through our, our website, uh, let me just uh, review the three key ideas. Jesus was preparing his disciples for the Spirit's power. Uh, secondly, Jesus wants uh, to us to be all about building his kingdom building his kingdom. And thirdly, he calls us to be witnesses, living in the Spirit's love and power. So we concluded last time, uh, beginning to look at verse 8, and I'd like to pick up today where we left off. My goal and desire for us today is to understand as completely as we possibly can what it means for us to be witnesses everywhere. That's the title I've chosen for this series. Those of you who were attending some of the evening services at which I preached last year probably have heard some of the things that I'm going to be mentioning uh, this week and then next Sunday as well, but it's time and it's important for the whole church to hear these things. We've heard verse 8 already a couple of times today. Jesus says, but you will receive power. When? When the Holy Spirit comes on you. And then what happens? And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria to the ends of the earth. Friends, that verse is the key verse in the book of Acts. And I would dare say in the entire New Testament. Thus, it is a key verse for all believers and all churches everywhere. It is such a key verse that I'm inclined to suggest that it be like a banner verse for our congregation for the year to come. We should never forget these words of our Lord Jesus. Now, Jesus made this statement in the context, right, of promising the baptism of the Holy Spirit uh, that was going to come upon his disciples. This verse tells us that the primary purpose of the baptism of the Holy Spirit is receiving power so that we can witness for Christ, so that the lost may be won and taught to obey all that God has commanded. Now the end result of that is for Jesus Christ uh, to be known and to be loved and to be praised and to be the Lord of all people in the earth. If you're a Christian today, that is God's purpose for your life. You maybe are wondering, what's my purpose in life? Well, there you have it. And even if you're not a Christian, you need to know that that is God's purpose for your life too. That is to say, God wants you to know him. God wants you to love him. God wants you to offer your praise to him. And he wants you to let him be the Lord of your life. That is what your creator wants for you. 
And so the question then is, uh, are you going to submit your life to what your creator, your maker, wants for you? Or are you going to live your life pursuing simply what you want? Which will it be? That's a huge choice and decision for all of us to make. It's a good question for all of us who are Christians as well as those who don't yet know the Lord. Reminds me of a conversation that I had with a, a woman years ago in one of the churches that I served. She said to me, Pastor, I wish that we would just stick to the simple gospel message and how God loves us instead of always talking about commitment and, and the call to be missionaries and, and to be ministers. I was kind of taken aback. Uh, I, I didn't know what to say to her. I, I kind of wanted, you know, with some tongue-in-cheek humor, some sarcasm to come back and say, so which pages of the Bible do you want to tear out? But I refrained. The problem was that her whole idea of the church was as a place of comfort and reassurance for her. And beneath that was a concept of Christianity that, that called for little personal involvement or consecration. Brothers and sisters, if we can sit here in church and Sunday after Sunday hear scriptural teaching about uh, God living in us and surrendering our wills to the Lord and being obedient disciples and sharing our faith and working for justice, but then do nothing more than be part of the cheering section for everybody else out there to do it, then we are missing something. We're missing something. And more than just missing the purpose of God for our life and the incredible joy that comes with that, my fear is that you might also be uh, stuck on dead center spiritually or, or actually even worse than that, by your religion opposing the purposes of God. How tragic would that be? Living in West Michigan, all of us have probably seen people who have been stuck with their car or their truck. Most trucks probably don't get stuck, right? Especially if they're four-wheel drive. But we've seen people stuck in the snowbank or in the ditches. I saw something years ago that kind of humored me. Somebody had gotten stuck, this was up in Muskegon, had gotten stuck along the side of the road. Um, and, and there were some people there that were trying to get this car out and as we sometimes do, you know, we learn about how to do this when we're going through driver's ed in Michigan. They were trying to rock the car back and forth, throw it into forward, throw it into reverse, throw it into forward, throw it into reverse. Well, they had a couple of people from behind the car pushing that way when it was put into, into forward. And then they had another guy in the front of the car so that when she threw it into reverse, it pushed the other way. Do you know what a foolish picture that is? I had to wonder who was going to get run over first. Here's another picture, this one taken from NASCAR, that kind of suggests the same idea. This is a picture of a church when some people are trying hard to move ahead on God's agenda and others are pushing the other way for their own agenda or for no agenda. Some people like churches that have no agenda. We can just come and sit here and have a great time and forget all the rest. Let me ask you this morning, whose agenda or what agenda do you think is being pushed at Forest Grove Reformed Church? You don't have to answer that out loud, but it's good that you're thinking about this. I would hope and I would pray that you would say God's agenda. God has given a set of priorities to the leader of this church, leaders of this church. I'm not thinking about just me here. Uh, all of our staff, all of our consistory, our ministry team leaders. Priorities that are conditioned by Holy Scripture and by the kingdom of God. Not conditioned by cultural Christianity. Not conditioned by personal preferences not conditioned by our denomination. 
We intend to pursue God's kingdom priorities with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength because we know that's what pleases God. That's what fulfills God's purposes on planet Earth. And God's promise in Acts chapter 1 is that he will give us the power we need to do that. Hallelujah. The Greek word translated power in our text is the word dunamis, from which we obviously get our English word dynamite. And it has more to do than just strength or ability. It means power in action power in operation. It's doing something. The, the tense of the Greek verb uh, screams that out loud. It's doing something. A stick of dynamite shows its real power when it's used to do something, like bring down an old abandoned building that has to be cleared off of a lot, or blast away part of a mountain so they can put a road there. If you have some sticks of dynamite sitting on the shelf in your garage, or in your basement, that's nothing more than a hazard. <laughs> that's nothing more than an enormous danger to people. But you take those sticks of dynamite off the shelf, and you go and do something productive, something constructive, even though dynamite is kind of destructive in all of our minds, but it's used for constructive purposes. Big things can be accomplished, right? The writer of Acts 1, verse 8, is suggesting that's what the Holy Spirit does inside of us, living inside of us, accomplishes great things when it gets into operation, when it's taken off the shelf. Both in his gospel and in this book of Acts, Dr. Luke shows that the baptism of the Holy Spirit upon the disciples of Jesus included power to preach the gospel to deliver people from evil spirits, to heal the sick, to raise the dead, to do all kinds of things. So power here means supernatural power, like the power that was demonstrated through Jesus' own life. And the power of God's Spirit, friends, is given specifically, this verse says, for us to be witnesses, just like Jesus was a witness to the glory of God the Father. Let's, let's back up in our Bibles a few pages. If you'll turn with me to John chapter 14. I want to have us look at a tremendous promise that Jesus makes. Let's turn to John 14, verses 12 to 14. Let's see what Jesus says here. John 14, verse 12. I tell you the truth. Anyone who has faith in me will do what I have been doing. Now look. He will do, or she will do, even greater things than these. Because I am going to the Father. And I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Son himself may bring glory to the Father. You may ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. So Jesus clearly tells us here that he is going to do the works of power that glorify God. It's going to be through us though, right? He's going to do it, but we're the means, the instrument by which it's accomplished. He says, whatever you ask in my name, not you will do it, I will do it. You can ask for anything in my name, and I will do it. So that means love without limits for people. Even the people we don't like. Even people who we would consider our enemies. It means sharing the gospel with people when we don't even know how to open our mouth. It means healing people's damaged, wounded, broken bodies, minds, and emotions. It can mean a lot of things. But did you notice in this passage there, there is something that we will do that Jesus says is actually greater than the work that, than he himself did? What in the world would that be? What is that greater work? Most Bible scholars agree that what Jesus is referring to here is the ability to present the message of his death and resurrection and his reign uh, to people all across the face of the earth through every age of time. To spread the gospel, 
to people everywhere at all times. God's eternal plan was for the gospel to be spread to the entire world. I think we understand that. But Jesus is not the one God intended to do that. No. Jesus came, he lived, he died, he rose again. Uh, but then God's plan was for Jesus to go back to his rightful place in heaven, which is exactly what happens in verse 9 of our Acts 1 text. Jesus is gone. And that's why the Holy Spirit is needed. But God's plan from the beginning of time was for the gospel to be spread by Jesus' followers, i.e., by us. By us. Which is why, and I've always thought this was kind of funny. Uh, it's not, but I, I saw some humor in this, that these two angels show up in the passage in verse 11. And, and they say to the disciples, why are you just standing here looking into the sky? Guys, get going. You've got work to do. Your divine calling is not to stand here looking up into heaven or worshiping the Lord or waiting for him to come back. Your divine calling is to go and make disciples and baptize and teach. That's your calling. That's your purpose. Get going. Friends, listen. God never imagined a church where people come and they sit and listen to some trained professional talk and then they stand around and drink coffee and eat cookies and then go home feeling blessed. God never imagined a church like that. And to the extent that that's the kind of church we are, we fail in fulfilling the Great Commission. And thus we fail our Lord and Savior. Don't we? Don't we? Let's look at the word witnesses now in verse 8. You've heard this before, I'm sure. But we get the word witness from the Greek word martus, and that gives us the English word martyr. It was absolutely true that back in the first century, disciples of Jesus had to be ready, willing uh, to lay down their lives for Jesus Christ. All of the 12 disciples, except Judas Iscariot, who committed suicide, and John the Beloved, who died of old age, we think, on the island of Patmos, died a martyr's death. But martyrdom for Christ has been happening for 2,000 years. It didn't just happen in the first 300 years of the church. It's been happening ever since. And do you know that in the last 100 years, there have been more martyrs for Christ than in the, the previous 1,900 years combined? It's happening at an alarming rate. And Rick and Stephanie could tell us a whole lot more about that. But we all need to be ready to, to lay our lives on the line for Christ. But now I'm thinking, you know, what's a really applicable, meaningful understanding of this for us living in the West, living in, you know, America where we have religious freedom and we're not persecuted, we're not oppressed, really. I think about Mark 8, 34. Some words of Jesus also spoken in Matthew's gospel, Luke's gospel. Jesus says, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel will save it. Friends, we are called to die to ourselves and die to our control of our privacy and our schedules so that we freely share what Christ has done and what he means to us with other people, including Muslims. Think about this. If we can't talk to another person about Christ without being afraid for our lives or feeling afraid of failing, or afraid of what somebody else thinks about us. Have we sufficiently died to ourselves? I think we know the answer to that question. I think this problem of us 
thinking about ourselves, thinking about what we sound like, what we look like, what we're doing. Am I doing it right? All of this is handcuffing the church. It's, it's blocking the church, crippling the church. If we let ourselves be rendered powerless by that, do we not effectually cut off the work of the Holy Spirit in us? to accomplish the Great Commission. I think we do. And I'm preaching to myself up here, folks. Don't feel like I've got evangelism down, down pat. Don't feel like the Petersons have evangelism down pat. No, you never arrive. But what, instead, I would, I would want us to think about ourselves this way, that we are conduits of the Holy Spirit's power. We're not reservoirs. We're not holding tanks. We're channels, and the Spirit's witness to Jesus Christ ought to flow through us. Now, I used this illustration in a message on stewardship last year. Some of you may remember that. Uh, but I think that the, the metaphor, the image of this, applies equally well to this subject, maybe even better. And I put a map of the, the Dead Sea up on the screen uh, because I, I want you to see that, you know, it's like fish don't live in the Dead Sea, except maybe just at the northern part up there by Qumran, where the Jordan River, a fresh water river, flows into the Dead Sea. But apart from that, fish do not survive in the Dead Sea because it's dead. Nothing survives in the, in the, the Dead Sea. Why? Because there's no outflow. There's no outflow. A pond or a, a swamp or a stagnant body of water, uh, it, it can't sustain life. And, and it doesn't really accomplish any life-giving purpose because it doesn't have any outflow. But a river, a stream uh, that's moving, on the other hand, sustains life and it purifies itself because the water is always moving through, always flowing through. Jesus said in John chapter 7, I'm the living water. Whoever drinks the water that I give will never thirst. And now listen to this. Indeed, the water that I give him will become in him a river of living water springing up to eternal life. Here's the thing, friends. The power of the Holy Spirit will be given to us in a constant flow as we communicate it to others. Think about that. As we use it for others, as we give it to others, it's not meant to be kept to ourselves. And if it is, we will gradually, eventually dry and wither. We will become dull, dreary Christians, and we will spiritually shrivel. That's happened to so many people in the West, Christians in the West. If all we do is take in and take in and take in knowledge and inspiration from the Bible and from sermons and classes and TV and radio programs and all of that, we will dry up like raisins in the sun because the Spirit's power is given to us to be witnesses. To be witnesses. Now there's another understanding or meaning of the word witness that I think is maybe a more obvious one for us today. Uh, it's a very helpful one, I think. Uh, think about a court of law, right, and a trial that's underway. If you are called to the stand as a witness, what are you there to do? Are you there to share your own opinions of what you think about what happened? Are you there to sit before the judge and the jury and spout off your ideas about what you think happened? No. A witness is a person who says, I know this to be true. I know this for a fact because of my personal experience and my observation. A witness doesn't say, I think so. A witness says, I know so. A true witness. So a question for us today is, are you an I think so Christian, or are you an I know so Christian? Can you say that you know 
Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? Or do you know a lot about Jesus and you think of him from time to time when you come to church, maybe when you pick up your Bible, but you think about him a little bit? My friend, if you are not absolutely certain that you are in a living, dynamic, intimate relationship with Jesus Christ, and you are ready to meet him like Betty Richards was ready to meet him on the day that you die, or on the day that Christ returns to judge the world, then you need to make a decision today. There was a time when John Bunyan, the famous author of the classic novel Pilgrim's Pro uh, Progress, was not sure about the truth of Christianity. What worried John Bunyan is that the Jews thought their religion was the best and had the sum and substance of the truth. The Muslims that he knew thought their religion was the best and other leaders and, and people of different religions that he had met and read about thought that their religion was the best and had the sum and substance of pure truth. So his question was, well, how do I know that Christianity is the one true religion that I ought to follow and give my life to? One day a dear friend who was a Christian witnessed to him and he used a verse of scripture to do so. It was Acts 4 uh, verse 12. He said, John, salvation is found in no one else except Jesus Christ. For there is no other name under heaven given to men whereby we must be saved. But then he said, but John, you will not know the absolute truth of that verse until you surrender and yield your life completely to Jesus Christ and you get to know him and love him. And John Bunyan did exactly that and it changed him forever. And I mean literally forever. And you know what? It will you too. It did me. Many of us can testify to the truth of that. So I want to invite us to the witness stand this morning. And I want to encourage us to um, be witnesses everywhere today. And how about if we do it this way? Uh, if you brought your own Bible, if you take your Bible, put it in your hand. Uh, if you didn't bring one, why don't you take a Bible out of the pew rack in front of you. Hopefully there's enough for everybody to have one. Uh, and let's just do like they do when, we, when they go to court and you're going to be a witness. You've got to be sworn in, right? You have to take this oath, a solemn oath. So let's stand and let me invite you to hold this Bible out in one hand if you're able. Um, yeah, and if you don't have both hands today, for some reason you can have the person next to you help you out. Uh, let's put your other hand on top of the Bible. And let's, let's say together the words of the Nicene Creed. Uh, this is part of what we need to witness to the world. These are the true facts about what Jesus Christ did and what God has done through Christ. Uh, so let, let's say these words together. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. I believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages. God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, consubstantial with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, and by the Holy Spirit was incarnate of the Virgin Mary, and became man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried, and rose again on the third day, in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, and with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and I look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated.